So, <clears throat> hello everyone. Uh, I'm happy to introduce today's seminar. Invited speaker, Dr. Dima da Silvia. Dr. Dima da Silvia is the department head of the Computer Science and Engineering Department at Texas A&M University. Her primary research interests are cloud computing, operating systems, distributed computing, and high and high end computing. Before joining uh, Texas A&M, she worked at a Qualcomm Research. IBM TJ Watson Center and University of Sao Paulo. So Dima is an ACM distinguished scientist, a member of the Board of Computer Research Associations Committee on the Status of Women in Computing Research. She has chaired 30 conference workshops and participated in more than 100 program committees. She has published more than 80 technical papers and uh, filed 15 patents. Received her doctor degree in computer science from Georgia Tech in 1997 and her bachelor and master degrees from University of Sao Paulo project. Her talk is about edge computing and the Internet of Things applications. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Dima da Silvia. I will not do well getting close to the microphone, but I guess I have to because yeah, the wireless microphone. That would be great. Yeah, I didn't think about it before. Because I usually don't need, as you can tell, but I hear that uh, they're recording, so... Yes? Um, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, that's not going to work. Right, that's okay, I will try. Otherwise, uh, people watching uh, the video will have to guess what I'm saying every now and then. It'll make it more interesting. <laughs> so it's, uh, I'm delighted to have a chance to come here. I know so many people from the faculty for a long time, and uh, you know, was, uh, you know, I'll go at some point, and I'm finally here, so it worked. So knitting read a very boring, you know, does this, does that. What matters here is that I'm going to talk to you about cloud computing and edge computing, and it is important that you understand the bias that I may be carrying on. So uh, you know, I was um, a student, you know, in Brazil. And I really wanted to be a faculty. There were no PhD in computer science in Brazil at the time. So I came to Georgia Tech, got my PhD as quick as I could. Not that quick, it only takes five, six years. But anyway, really going back, I was a faculty for a while there. And then I thought, well, it would be nice to be in a place that have more people in systems. I was the only systems person at the time in, in, in the University of Sao Paulo. So at IBM Research, there were tons of them, of all flavors. You know, it is a big building, around 3,000 people, 2,500 PhDs, I believe, or something like that, or used to be. I worked there for a long while, a total of 12 or 13 years. And when I got bored, they decided I could have an extra job. So after, I don't remember how many years, it's like, oh, I'm bored. I think you know, I need something else. I said, well, have an extra team. So I had a team in Ireland. They were opening the IBM Research in Ireland. And I had a very large team there. And I split my time between uh, Dublin and New York. Um, but I got bored. <laughs> when, I, uh, when I got bored is that you know you need to learn more. And after learning with very large computers, I didn't really know much about what happens with cell phones. So Qualcomm told me, you know, we'll hire you. You have one year just to learn, and then after that, you know, uh, you work means then you 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 help us to have better revenue and things like that. So I joined Qualcomm Research. Qualcomm uh, is. Um, has its headquarters in San Diego because the founders were from University of California, San Diego. But if you need software people, you may think that San Diego may not be the best place. So the research lab, in particular, all the software operations, or most of the software operations, were in Santa Clara. So I was there for a while and talking to a lot of the collaborators, so really talking to spend uh, two years in Silicon Valley, working with many companies. And then I, this, you know, I always wanted to go back to academia and work with the students, and I had the opportunity, and I joined three years ago Texas AAM. 
Okay, so that's, you know, you see my perspective is very focused uh, on this when cloud computing research was born, so I was in all these new conferences on the steering committees and things like that, and trying to make cloud to work at IBM. So I'll try to give you my story about what happened with the cloud, and that takes most of the talk so that we can understand now what may happen with the next generation for cloud. So cloud computing uh, is the new normal, no one questions that has many advantages about being able to use hardware, storage, networking resources that are not here. That is somewhere else that you pay and rent them. You know, it's very, very interesting. But that was not in the beginning uh, very clear. So if you're around in 2007, 2008, um, and you're talking about cloud, you couldn't avoid seeing this example for this startup called Animoto. So Animoto was a startup in Silicon Valley. They would get your music and your pictures and produce one of those videos that you see when you go to weddings. And they supposedly very intentionally, uh, very computationally intensive. I really don't know exactly why, but uh, it was, it was, you know, one of many startups at that time in California. Remember the situation for startups, 2002, really bad, and then started to go 2005, so it was really good, so there were many. Um, and so they had this service that they were offering for free. This is still the time that you try to capture users. It was the way that you grew. And um, they had uh, someone very influential at Facebook. Remember at that time, the Facebook was the thing doing trends. That really liked it and posted. So they really had many more users very quickly. So those graphs that are really bad, you know, they have been photographed from some conference and people keep reproducing them. The horizontal axis is time. It's one week in April in 2008. That's the horizontal axis. The vertical axis is trying to capture how much computational resource this startup was allocating to serve their users. They had both you know, web servers that get the requests and these backend servers that who ran these algorithms that were matching pictures and, uh, and uh, music. And so they were going on and their friends were using it and they had around uh, 50 servers working for them. And then when they became very popular and they had more and more people going to their website and uploading this music and pictures, in a matter of a couple of days, they had to go from 50 servers uh, running the back end to almost 5,000. And uh, in terms of the front end processing the URL requests, also they uh, had to uh, go very, uh, a very drastic increase. So you had some computers and you go on. Well, so this is really good, but back in 2007 to that time, if uh, you are just using computers like most startups, you cannot get thousands of computers out of the box. So you go buy them, deliver it, open the box, put the network cards, install Linux. Even if you came here to FIU and hired all your undergrads and paying for hours, this takes time. I can attest that installing or getting a network of 200 uh, uh, blades, which is much easier. I had done in 2007 with a colleague, the two of us, and took, we thought we were going to, to get done it over the weekend, and it took us three weeks. So, you know, supposedly, you know, how many PhDs you need to install <laughs> something. Anyway, so this was incredible, and they managed to get all those machines up and learning because they were not using real machines. They were using this new service that Amazon had that was about renting computer with the same credit card that you buy books or diapers. The same credit card, the accounting comes in the end, and it, at that time you're paying nine cents an hour. So they were not that afraid of putting on their credit card. And they could grow up very quickly. So that was, was really wow. So this is really good for a startup. The picture does not show you what happened in the week after, but you are not surprised to learn that people was not enamorated anymore with this service. <laughs> and had them 
really acquired more computers, they would have now to get rid of the computer. And therefore, but with Amazon, they threw scripts, brought machines up, threw scripts, brought them down, and stopped paying. And didn't pay anything probably until May 1st, where the credit card uh, thing came up. So that was great, and the New York Times wrote about it, and the New York Times decided that to um, digitize their whole collection of uh, newspapers since 18, whatever it is, uh, 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 in the 19th century, that they would also use this. And everyone was really uh, impressed by agility, meaning how quick you can get things running. You know, don't think that quick is that you get a new machine in 10 seconds. It was probably in the, um, an hour, but that was an hour is much better than 36 hours to buy and record everything. Uh, elasticity, the growing quickly, in particular, getting rid of it, because for the startups, they were all trying a lot of things that were not working. And uh, for companies, the idea now that is not a capital expense like computers, but it is like uh, a normal travel expense. So think about the faculty here who have grants, and you have that money, you said it's computers, it has to be computers, you know, you don't have that flexibility. And now it is that you can put them in a more flexible budget. Uh, so that was really good for a lot of people. Well, so what a company like IBM, Microsoft, HP, or what those companies did, did they um, jump directly into that? Uh, not really, you know, people thought, oh, well, of course Amazon can make money, can have a profit margin at nine cents an hour for a Linux instance, mach a Linux machine, because they have to have all those computers anyway that they have to buy to serve black, uh, black uh, you know, your Friday, Thanksgiving, Black Monday, and the 15 days before Christmas. They already have for it, so they're actually now just recovering. So there was a lot of analysts in all those companies thinking that you could not make uh, money unless you already have to have the hardware, the data center like Amazon had. So that means that companies like IBM and Microsoft start to look into that, but not really thinking they were, that this is a, a transformational business. In the meantime, Animoto died, but Pinterest came to uh, uh, came to, uh, to be more popular, right? So here it's, it's showing, I can't read, uh, yes, from 2011 on. And uh, anyone who here uses Pinterest? <laughs> a few, a few. On this, on this crowd, only females. Pinterest for a long time was 85% females. Right now, it's not anymore. A lot of guys really like motorcycles and cars and other things, and they captured that market. So I believe right now is 67% uh, female. And it is well known to have a very good click-to-buy ratio, right? So, but they, this is all now. What they really captured the imagination of uh, Silicon Valley is because they grew faster than Twitter, faster than Facebook. You know, look at the uh, millions of uh, unique numbers, just going up, up, up. And in 2013, uh, you don't get many recent numbers because of all this IPO thing, going on IPO, but you know, the numbers from 2013, they have 2.5 billion page views per month. More importantly, they got there without buying a single machine, paying for any air conditioner for any data center. Very different from Twitter, Google, Facebook, who had to get capital money to really invest on a lot of it. Uh, they also only had one engineer, up to 10 million users. I would not want to have that job. I don't know about <laughs> you. Uh, a lonely job to start with doesn't fit my personality. But more importantly, the thing is, the idea here for Pinterest was let Amazon do this stupid thing of patching Linux for security and when a hardware disk drive that they are the ones who handle that. We will just think about how to be a company that is mobile first. They were the first company designing first for tablets and mobile phones before people think that you would spend the whole day on the cell phone and also trying to do an advertisement business that was good. So that was their thing. Computing, we will pass to them to the other people do. But don't think it's that easy. This. Uh, 
This is from 2016, so last year, a talk that someone from Pinterest gave about just a little part of getting new code deployed. So just deploying new code on Amazon, they have now, I believe, 107 engineers. That's uh, at least that's the last number I, I was able to see online. And they use all kinds of tools and things to be able that the new code get deployed and they collect the data. So it's still complicated. So if you do back end, you still, you know, you know, this is this job is not going anywhere just because you have cloud computing. But they do not have to worry about failures. Okay, and things like that. So cloud really captured uh, the attention of a lot of people because elasticity, I keep repeating that, but that's important. The idea that was self-service, not calling Dell for a new computer. It is all about uh, APIs. Yes, you can click, but you can uh, write scripts. It was that from the beginning. And you have many options very easily. So you, you will pay nine cents for one thing, 17 cents if you want a more memory. And you do that uh, kind of uh, math yourself and you can change your mind very often. Uh, they also offer the ability for you to say where you want uh, your server to be. And you may decide you want uh, one in Virginia and one in, in Oregon. And uh, the chance that both of them will go down at the same time is smaller. And it, it'll be really hard for your company to have multiple data centers. You have to be really a very big company. But now you're a small company and you can have multiple data centers. Uh, and you pay as you go, so that also helps on, on, the, on the strategic planning. I already mentioned from uh, moving that money from, uh, this is more for the big companies' account. It's very complicated, so, uh, but for them made a difference, the capital versus uh, uh, common expense. And finally, the economy of scale. So the idea that uh, Amazon could do uh, for nine cents an hour at that time, and now you can even as low as five dollars per month get you a kind of very powerful uh, server, is because they have large data centers. So what is scaling? That means that they will go to vendors and they will say you either sell me for this price or I don't buy, and this really makes a difference. So. When Facebook or Google or Microsoft are buying computers, they can make the specification, they can ask for changes in the hardware, and, and, and they can do things uh, that way. There are also young companies. Uh, the young companies can buy things more on everything similar, not all kind of different servers. Like if you look at IBM, HP, they have a lot of legacy systems too. So the economy of scale coming from uh, numbers. Another economy of scale is the cost for system administrators, and I will uh, cover that uh, coming soon, okay? Right. So um, I talked to you about the business sounding so good, but let's just uh, stop a little second not to think that this is all about how genuine one company or another company was in seeing uh, this idea of selling computing as a commodity, as uh, you know, the same way as you plug energy uh, in, in the wall. Uh, what really was transformational was the work that the systems community did to allow that flexibility on selling machines. And I wanted to talk to you a little about that. So I want to give credit to the people who are advanced the area of virtualization. So if you took that in operating systems, you'd be a little bored, uh, but I hope, uh, I hope not. So this is a graph that is super busy um, and uh, I believe the horizontal axis go from 96 to 2013. I need to pay 20k to get the newest one. I'm not going to do that. So uh, when they read the process, the, I'll have the 2014 uh, soon. But I think uh, uh, it gets the idea. On time, we are looking at money is spent in servers. The definition of a server is a machine that is not for users to do. It's not the laptops here or our cell phones. Our machines that will be running larger workloads, enterprise workloads. So this is not user, uh, individual user. That's the definition of servers. And our graph has two vertical axes. On your left, you are going to see money. How much money in billions of dollars has been circulating on acquiring servers and keeping those servers running. So it's how much our whole 
you know, our world spends in getting all those machines spinning and doing computing for us. On the other one, is just how the number of machines, uh, what they call installed base, how many servers are installed worldwide. These numbers come from IDC, uh, the report from 2014 is still the most uh, uh, up to date. So if you look at this, so let's see, let's take money first. So it's the height of the whole bar. More money is being spent. Good, right? We, uh, we care for computing. We like more money in this industry. That's all good. Okay, so I worked for IBM uh, um, for a long time, and IBM sold a lot of hardware. So they really care about how many, how much of that money is in buying hardware. That is the part of the bar that is a little purple or, I don't know, bluish, the lower part. You look at it, it, in the best case, remains constant, it's actually going down. So for a long while, this is since 96, you know, companies like IBM, HP, anyone, uh, AMD or Intel or, or uh, Dell, they are not really happy that people are spending money the same. They are buying more computers. The uh, number of computers, the blue line, it, you're growing more computers for a while, then you stop, but for a while, but the computers were being cheaper. Therefore, the amount of money was the same. So not very good news you know, if you work for IBM like I did at that time. Okay, but so where the money is going? The top green slice is cooling, infrastructure, power and cool. You have to give power so they can run, and those things generate a lot of heat. You better have a very cooling system. Power energy keeps growing up. So if you look at the slides, it kept kind of growing, so people got worried about that. The middle part, the orange one, is management and administration. This is people uh, to get those computers running, not programmers, just system management, a lot of people, of course we like, because we want our students to be very highly paid, right? Good news for us, we wanted that part to be expensive, the companies hate. <laughs> and also, let's think also, so try to think like if you are sit, the, the, the CIO, the Chief Technology Office, Chief Information Officer, the one who gets from the CEO and, the, and from the board of the corporation how much money you have for IT. Let's remember what was happening in 96. In the 80s, computer was the new thing. If you didn't have, you'd be dead. So every bank threw a lot of money at it. Macy's threw a lot of money at it. The supermarkets threw a lot of money. Everyone, the IT person said, I need 100 million more, or oh, here's the check. So the days, all the 90s, that kept going on. Remember the World Wide Web came, you know, the parents are on the internet, everyone is kind of coming on the internet, you know, 96, no, no, certainly not my parents on the internet, no. But uh, all of us that were in computing were in the internet. People were still spending money. But at some point, with the checks having to get so much bigger, it became like everything. Why? What is the return on investment? Why do you need more money to deliver the same thing? We don't give the marketing department more money if they deliver the same return on investment. We don't do that for accounting or HR. So people started to see this as an overhead of the business, important, the same thing that sales, paying people to sell things at uh, stores is important, but not transformational anymore. So they were like, cut it out. Why are you getting so expensive? Why you need more machines? You're not doing that much more. And why are people getting more expensive? And then you wonder, why is that? And if you look at uh, the, the, those data centers, let's just, uh, I think the numbers I know by heart would be around 2004, and data centers across the country, flowers.com, uh, you know, anything you know that has some computers running things for you. So how uh, these were those computers? Let's think about it. Uh, let's measure busy in terms of how much the CPU is working. Even your laptop, you can look now and say, oh, the CPU is probably 20% busy. Just processing little packages that are arriving on the internet, doing something, you know, on the background. 
probably 20%. I'm not sure. I, I could see myself on that, how, how the CPU is. Okay. So in a data center, how busy in 2004 you think in average, in an average weekday, the servers were busy? Each one. So let's say you have a thousand computers. They were all of them 90% busy or 9% busy? Who want to go low, fast? Uh, low. low, right. The, 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 it was a really sad thing. It was 10% in average. If you went to flowers.com 40 hours before Mother's Day, like their peak of the year, maybe you'd see a 45%. So why were these stupid computing engineers, computer scientists, IT people buying more computers to do Spend idle. You don't. You don't hire more salespeople to be idle on the store, yeah. right? So why do you have more computers? So what if our <laughs> department chair of computer science here decided that we have way too many computers on these faculties? The faculty had to share computers. Why would that be difficult? Because you have one faculty who had this brilliant student in 99 who did the simulation model that was only on Linux 2.0. So they'll say, I need this machine because this is mine because I'm going to install Linux 2.0. The other stuff from the other faculty leads a Linux that is like 3.3. And of course, we have many of us who use MATLAB running on Windows. And what happens is the same thing in companies, even worse because in a big business it was for many companies, uh, IBM, but I, I think even more for other companies like Accenture and everything, is just to know what is installed and sh can we delete it without anyone noticing. If, this is a big business, right? So, so it was like there's all these machines and we are afraid of doing anything and some of them are uh, running DB2 and they need this Oracle hardware and some, oh, I'm sorry, DB2 running PowerPC hardware from IBM or I have the Oracle database running on Spark or I have, th so you had all those machines and you could not do that. So the weird thing is that there were a few computers in many data centers, the mainframes, and the mainframes run at around 95% average utilization. So one thing is that mainframes are very busy. No one is just going to keep paying $1.5 million in another mainframe to do nothing. And the mainframes uh, learn how to run multiple operating systems, multiple versions of operating systems in the 60s. Uh, beyond that, the mathematicians and the computer scientists at IBM Research in the 60s published papers about the necessary and sufficient conditions for a computer to run multiple operating systems. Really very formalized mathematically and everything. People know, given a hardware, can this hardware run multiple operating systems or not? What is the problem with running multiple operating systems? Operating system is the guy who thinks that it's the really king of the whole thing. It is the one who will say who gets memory, which part of memory, and when. So if you put two operating systems on the same hardware, they don't know how to be a sub-queen, right? So you, the solution is to have a super duper operating system under, the call hypervisor, that the job is to now do allocation of those operating systems and make with this one level of interaction things work. And that has been working uh, for the mainframes since the 60s. And uh, why we didn't have with uh, the mini computers and then the personal computers and things like that? Because people didn't feel the need, you know, the hardware of doing that. Intel was developing hardware on this new world. x86 was becoming de facto. And x86 had, you know, at that time, I'm talking now 2000, he had, they had nine instructions that did not respect the conditions to be virtualized. These instructions, they are special instructions, but if an operating system calls that instruction, nothing happens. They don't do anything, they don't tell anyone. So it becomes very hard. What you'd like to, you'd like that a special instruction is issued, the hypervisor says, oh, they, they want to let me handle for it, because I am the special one, and then I give the results, 
and things continue. But you have to be able to see, to observe that the operating system is trying to do something privileged. But there were nine instructions for x86 that did not have that, so x86 was broken. So uh, at that time, uh, working on another problem, uh, Professor Mendel Rosenblau and, and his students decided that if the software is not doing anything, if it's so slow and you have capacity, why don't you try to solve that in the software? That was really the time that people think C++ was too slow to be an operating system language. People like, what? Have the software look at instructions? This is not going to work. But they did it, and they did it for x86, and they uh, found that VMware, and they showed that could run with, yes, 30% overhead. Those 30% overhead was still much better if you could have less, instead of two machines, one machine. They, made, they did many other things very right in terms of business, nice user interfaces, good education of users. So it's not only technology, they solve the technology. And then, of course, AMD and Intel said, well, we don't want to give our lunch to VMware. We will fix our hardware. And they slowly, meaning they, they quickly released the new hardware. They had introduced virtualization, but they had probably a 15% overhead on hardware. But slowly they fixed perfectly. The next thing they had to fix all the overheads and um, the hardware now uh, can be virtualized. So that's what I want to take you this detour to see that industry for other reasons and starting from academics uh, made it possible to run multiple workloads, application plus whatever the application needs, libraries and operating systems in a single machine. So that's why you know Amazon can have a number of machines and sell many virtual machines. And that's what they tell they sell us, right? So the red flag, uh, sorry, the red line is the number of virtual machines. So in the beginning, there is essentially the same as the number of machines. It's just that mainframes have many virtual machines, but only the mainframes. And when you look at 2004, that's when you start to have more, and then you know VMware, and then many other solutions came. And right now, you have in the industry much more uh, virtual machines than physical machines. And in this time, 2002, when, when VMware was doing it, the open the the academic uh, community did for Linux. Then the industry decided uh, to be nice and support that open source because open source is a very good way of avoiding someone to dominate the market. So right, so whenever you have some open source and some non-open source, other companies will support. So that's why you would see almost all of the main uh, Linux uh, and uh, open source Zen and then later KVM, the virtualization platforms based on Linux, uh, based on open source that uh, the engineers were being paid by large corporations. Uh, and of course, Red Hat and you know the, the open source companies. So, the, so in your uh, management and administration, you also take into account the, the carbon emission from the code, you know, from the... No, no, that, that there, are, there are other people who look into that, and uh, HP had a researcher who really worked on that, he now works for Google, uh, and really looking at that. No, this is really just the students managing, I'm sorry, the students, the system administrators running Linux and installing patches and running to exchange a disk and a network interface that broke, that kind of thing. So that is uh, something that was there. I want to, uh, the, the last historical thing that we should keep in mind was that uh, uh, Amazon was offering this new service at a point that a lot of people paid attention on Google's MapReduce, which also had the open source Apache platform. So let's look at what Google did beyond any very you know, interesting, and I, I really don't know such outreach, so I don't know how uh, fantastic or whatever they were. Besides that, Google made the decision that in their company they would use very cheap hardware and have the software be designed to handle failures. This thing stopped working, the infrastructure, not the programmer, the infrastructure would get another machine to take that task. So that was. Um, their, you know, MapReduce 
uh, more than how we do this bigger data thing, it was how I program when a library takes care of failures for me. And what was uh, important for them is that there is no way they would buy hardware from IBM, the x86 or power systems from IBM or HP or those, they were designed to be resilient. They had to do double power. Their, their memory chips had error correction code. A lot of things to be resilient. They just like, no, we're going to what they call pizza boxes, the cheapest thing I can put together. And if it fails, uh, we'll go again. And that was uh, this, this idea of being able to use a lot of infrastructure with the software doing resilience had been proved uh, by Google in some scenarios and then other uh, social computing companies were using with success means that if you really want to use that platform, you're not going to buy 200 machines. This is perfect. You run your big data map reduced in Amazon. It's perfect. They fail more because, okay, uh, Amazon was clear at the time that uh, if they needed the machine, they would just kill your job. You're paying nine cents, but if we need the machine, we will just kill your job and you accept the terms of condition. Now there are many different types of terms of condition, but that was the one that they had at that time. But that's okay with you because the infrastructure, if you're using Apache, they'll take care of it, okay? So, uh, so that's, that's what uh, went on. And then the, the, the management, Amazon was operating, we um, speculated based on a lot of sources that in 2007 they had one system administrator for 1,500 physical machines. You know, uh, I think uh, I would argue that here in the university you probably have one student managing 40 machines or something like that. The average in industry for a lot of companies would be from 50 to 200 machines. Why they were able to do so many? Because they could tell which type and they were automating everything and investing on that automation when the others were not. Okay. And uh, so this was refreshing for industry, for operating system, distributed system people, that was really fresh air because the, the, the research was a little stale and now you had all those problems about us operating system management in large scale. And, uh, and many new conferences, you have to handle efficiency, resilience, problem determination is very important, not only when something goes wrong, you know, you, you really need to bring that uh, infrastructure up very soon because nothing on the internet is working. We're in a society right now that in California, many cities, when Facebook is not working, they call 911. <laughs> it is for true. This is, you know, I read the article, I found very interesting. So, what I, and then if Amazon is not working, there was December 24, uh, 13, some little mistake that someone did and Netflix, which runs on Amazon, was not working. People were not very happy. They wanted to watch, you know, their Christmas movie with the family or whatever. So uh, it is very important to be able to get those things running and that's really hard and we have to, a lot of research has been done on it and uh, of course a lot of things there. Software engineering, even harder, but uh, uh, software engineering is hard. <laughs> what we can do, okay? So what I try to say right now for you know Web 2.0, the, the, like uh, running um, Google search. I mean, do you really care if search doesn't give you the exactly best answer or if it lies to you? No one is dying, so uh, that's cloud. Uh, that's fine. You scale out analytics, map reduce. Also, not hard to run that. People thought that databases you were not going to run on. Who is going to put this stuff on money? People, I mean, I remember some, uh, you know, very senior, senior VP at IBM look at me and call and call me when uh, Google puts their own databases on their uh, dynamic data centers. Uh, well, now people do, and, uh, and, and Google actually does. They published in 2012 a paper, but only 2012. Look, they were publishing papers in 2000. Only 2012 they showed how they actually have the database of clicks, you realize the clicks is what they count to make money on, right? So this is, they can't miss a click and they cannot charge for a click that did not exist. Uh, so for that one, it is totally distributed in data centers and so running well on a cloud environment, okay? In, I told you the poster child for Amazon, it was Animoto, in 2012 was Pinterest, in 2015 was Capital One, a bank. Capital One in 2015 said that they were going from eight data centers to three. 
and all those other five will be running on Amazon. And that's what they're doing. In 2017, it is a company that produces uh, John Deere. The one that the tractors, the tractors yeah, that has yeah, yeah caterpillar. caterpillar. But I think it is the competitor. There are two big ones. The competitor one Come on. runs. Come on. Yeah. Come on. It could be. I should, you know, I at some point knew, otherwise it would be written there to help my memory. <laughs> uh, you know, I guess I, I need to refresh the, the presentation. But anyway, uh, it is those getting all those sensors and going to the cloud. And right now, they don't go direct to the tractor. They go to the engineers who look at the information and manually adapt the tractors and things like that because they have all these sensors for moisture and everything. Another one that goes to the cloud, BMW, if anyone here has the very top BMW model, what happens is that they're all the time um, doing suspension analysis to get potholes, very important in the northeast of the country because of the snow plowers. Uh, what happens then is that uh, that data is on real time sent to the other cars and will help to adjust the system not to damage your car, and that is helping all. And it's going through the cloud on Amazon. So it's uh, so, you know, it's really many more workloads, okay? Uh, so I never defined cloud. I mean, I usually, you know, I've been giving in cloud talks since 2006 and it was all about defining cloud, but I, you know, I had this idea that you understood what it is. Uh, but I would like to show you this picture from Forbes from July. Uh, so the top 10 companies in cloud, because that implies the definition of cloud a little bit. Right, so top ten companies in movies. You are defining who makes movies. So uh, you know Microsoft. Uh, so this is based on money, on they report. Um, oh, Amazon for many years did not report their cloud system. So that's for many years. Many of the top in some traditional companies is like they don't not making money on it. But then later on, when they separated Amazon Corporation and Amazon Web Services, as they call it. You could see that the profit margin is wonderful. With Microsoft, Microsoft got this really, uh, really nice change with the new CEO because their cloud business is bringing a lot of money. It's not because we are paying for Office 365. <laughs> no, because that's that's how they made money before. It just doesn't make money on that scale anymore. But they got that business, so that's why the corporation is still very desired. And then in second, you have AWS and Salesforce. So Salesforce, if you do not know, it, they sell uh, CRM, Custom Relationship Management Software, and they are pre-Amazon and everything. The idea that you know, if you have a, a, a database of customers and things like that, and you used to send that disk for this dentist, the dentist was going to install on this machine and didn't work and they had to call. What a bad, boring business have all this customer service for installing this little application. And they were the first to said, well, we're going to have it on the web, everything served on the web, and they're going to pay based on how many customers they put on the system and how many things, how much they use the reports. So if you are a dentist, don't you just want to pay there per month instead of having you know, this high school kid helping you to install. So uh, Salesforce uh, came before the cloud and it just, it's really, really makes money. Um, SAP, from the whole uh, way that SAP does enterprise uh, management of uh, supply chain and, and a lot of things, they also move things for the cloud. But it's like, did you think about SAP as a cloud company? So the cloud definition is a little broad now, right? So that's why it's more confusing than it used to be now. They are a company that is also selling services where you pay per usage, and therefore they're being called cloud. And uh, you know, IBM made more money than Amazon in the last year in cloud, just in this particular uh, thing, right? Uh, their, their revenue didn't go up as much as Amazon, so uh, it's hard to compare because I think IBM only reports money that is already in the bank. I think AWS reports to the end of the year based on average expense, you know, and let, you know, I know you don't care about it, but the whole article in Forbes was about that. So you understand people really care about reporting of money. And what about Google? Google, we know that they have a huge 
way of uh, having their services, but it's for now they're not caring that much about us using their services. They do have a cloud offering, but it's not uh, a big focus. And Workday at Texas A&M, we are now moving to Workday. It's an HR system, and they're big. Um, you know, so uh, anyway. And VMware, VMware in the sense that they sell a lot of the basic technology for those companies. Uh, Amazon uses an open source one. Google uses, you know, uh, an open source one. Uh, okay, so but now you came here to hear about the edge and you haven't heard anything. And I want to quickly tell you that besides those, people try to do cloud for mobile and I'm going to skip it. Just saying that there was a super cool product, company, startup that helped you do applications very quickly by doing the, the backend for you and charging by invocations of calls. And in 2013, they thought this would be the next big thing in the internet. And it, it didn't. Uh, a Facebook acquired Parse, clearly a talent acquisition because they made the software open source and they just cared about the engineers. So what I'm trying to say is that all those things about cloud and mobile together didn't go much anywhere. Uh, AWS has something for mobile, very simple, okay? And uh, uh, then now people are just like, oh, so it's all about IoT, right? If, if I want to have a new company, or if I'm a researcher and I'm trying to look at the new innovation clouds that may be required, is for this uh, service. Because right now we're thinking web services, enterprise services, now we're thinking actual cyber physical devices who have connectivity and can invoke function calls, send data, and receive control. Uh, and that's uh, that, and now people say, to, what, you, what analysts will tell you is that the big business for software for Internet of Things is on edge computing, but what edge? So we know more or less the cloud means that there is the full network going through your cellular network or your broadband network that gets you to the data centers that people have. Okay, so that is cloud. We are far through the network, we get to the cloud, they send the results back, and, uh, and that's it, okay? Some people say that with the edge computing is that you move some of the things that were in the data centers in the actual network layer. So this already happens a little bit. Netflix pays at and Verizon, uh, I don't know which is the main broad provider here in Florida, but you know, Time Warner, uh, um, Optimal, all those companies who provide internet services, they pay them to put their servers in their data centers. So that the movie, when it gets the request, the movie comes to you instead of getting to at and if you're watching in your cell phone, and you have AT&T as your provider, and going to Netflix, and then from Netflix to AT&T and to AT&T from you. That's not really very uh, good for real time, or soft real time. Therefore, they do, so it's already people put it there, but they're now thinking not only the network providers, but that, for example, that for disaster recovery, hurricane things, could be some machines that the cloud has here on campus in our data center so that if you cannot talk to Virginia or Portland, Oregon anymore, then you talk to the data center here. So that one definition of edge. Cisco came with this name fog computing. I like the name, you know, you have the cloud, the cloud now got close to meets the fog. I thought it was really cute. A lot of academics hate it. Uh, a lot of powerful NSF program managers uh, do not like it, so I don't recommend you to use the name FOG. <laughs> stick to Edge. You stick to Edge. And the Edge Computing is the name of the ACM has, uh, actually has a, a conference on Edge Computing. So that is the name. But they were the first one. Uh, look, Cisco sells routers, very expensive routers, has a lot of spare capacity on the routers. You don't pay $25,000 for a router for it not to have a lot of CPU there. So of course they're very interested on bringing the cloud into those routers, right? N not, not surprising, not, su that's, you, not surprising why would Qualcomm hire a cloud person? The same thing, they do routers, and they do the routers when you buy Bell, Click, and those, uh, and they're actually the hardware coming from, from, from Qualcomm. So uh, that's not surprising. But what really made it more confusing is, uh, when some people, this comes from a presentation for this industry tendency thing, 
where clouds, their data center will have thousands. We agree, we have thousands of data centers in the world, not much more than thousands, cloud, good name. Then they are calling these computers that you have on the network infrastructure as fog nodes and the edge as the devices. And that's, uh, that's uh, that makes sense, but I think most people are using is calling the bow part just devices. They are the devices, and then the middle part are the edge nodes. I think that will converge to, to, to this. And what is this slide that I, oh yes, yeah. so what is this slide? Uh, so there is a professor, uh, Professor Satya from Carnegie Mellon. So Professor Satya was able, uh, was first, I mean, famous to me because of the Andrew uh, distributed file system from Carnegie Mellon that became a company that was sold to that. So, you know, that's a lot of bases of databases. So he did a lot of important work there. Then he did mobile computing. And on mobile computing, he also published a lot of papers. So it's like one of those king of the hills, right? He has thinking about having clouds on the router since 2009. And he has had papers rejected in the area since 2009. So then you stop, you know, my papers are rejected every now and then, I'm used to that. But when it's someone that people tend to believe, who really goes and gives the keynotes everywhere, people hear ideas, so there was this uh, resistance. So what is the cloud let, that's his name, it is, you know, a cloud that drops to the floor, so it's a cloud lab, that was his name. But anyway, for the, the, their definition is a small data center at the edge of the internet, so at the edge of the network. Just one hop from your cell or from your IoT device. That's so, uh, in terms of definition, he cleaned up a little bit more what it is, and he says in his case it's always subordinated to the cloud, doesn't exist on itself. So if you ever need a terminology in this area, looking at his work uh, will be good. And he also says that uh, he assumes that you have energy that is not a mobile device, it is plugged in somewhere, and uh, you know, in terms you don't have to worry that it's going to be too hot and has to cool down, that kind of thing. So anyway, so if you need more definitions, I'd like to cite. And uh, oh, um, so he has been uh, sending papers about his systems with uh, Elia for a while. And, uh, and you know, I would either see this, the paper where I was on the program committee or because a colleague knowing that I was working on that at uh, Qualcomm would send me. So I was seeing, uh, you know, the rejections. I was happy to, so, and the application motivation changed many times. He used disaster military systems where you really, have to shut down the contact with the cloud for something. So he had, he had good environments, but it was not fine. Why? Because people said, tell me something you really cannot do going to the cloud. So uh, even, you know, his collaborators, uh, the CTO of Akamai, Akamai is the delivery content network, right? So the company that made so much money by caching uh, the, the, in, you know, caching the web close to us because the people my age remember when you visit a page for a professor and the picture would show like one line. <laughs> you take like five minutes later the picture was low, but we still remember that, <laughs> right? And then when they came caching closer, the most popular pages, they really did a lot of time. So if you think that's their business to accelerate applications, and his own company, he cannot convince anyone to do that because it show me when you don't need the latest. Why? Um, so, uh, but he got a paper uh, published, uh, Satya, and the first one uh, was a best paper to the start, best paper Mopsis, and it was about the following application scenario: Google Glasses, 2014, very popular. And you're walking around in your neighborhood uh, filming your child, children, but you can't have the other kids from the neighborhood on the movie. It is not right. But you know, you cannot send all possible movies to do the algorithm that will uh, uh, kind of uh, foggy the other kids. It's very easy to do, to remove like people from the image. But if you send to the cloud, first you're already sent to the cloud, you shouldn't, and your sending is too much data. So then people are like, oh yeah, we have to have that close to where the data is produced. So 
So that was the first application. Uh, currently, you know, uh, he has applications related to assisted living. People, you know, I live by myself. And therefore, if I'm going to be 80, if I have the computers remind me, Dilma, the milk doesn't go on the microwave, the milk goes on the fridge. And counting how many times I, you know, watch TV, how many times I do this and that. All this counting and a lot of video processing. Probably I do not want that going for privacy and for a bandwidth to go to the cloud. So there is this idea that for uh, this you have. Another one is when this Pokemon Go mania was happening and you think that at some point we have virtual reality applications everywhere. Again, you may want to have some computers local doing that uh, uh, processing of virtual reality. So last week we had ACA, um, IEEE, Symposium on Edge Computing, and uh, Satya gave the keynote, uh, you know, and uh, I'm just showing this so you understand what papers are. The session was all about vehicular edge computing, so with autonomous vehicle, with more cars and more roads making decisions, can you afford to go to the cloud? Remember the question, can you afford? Probably not. If the car needs to make a very complex decision about uh, do I kill this kid or that kid, so it's a bad example. I know. Uh, but you know, there are, if, if, if I prioritize X or Y, I may need more data, but I may not be able to go to the cloud. So there's a lot of things on that application. The other papers had a lot of things about virtual, virtual reality and video analysis. For the system people here, um, You'll not be surprised how you place VMs or containers on the edge, how you migrate VMs or containers on the edge. So the things that I have been doing, uh, you know, leading the, uh, you know, the system managed, resource management, very large scale, how you do that for the edge. So those are all the things that uh, uh, were that. Uh, some people expect to have, NSF had a, a big workshop on edge computing uh, nine months ago or so. Um, uh, with a lot of uh, NIST was there, so NIST also is interested in that, the, the standards, uh, uh, they are funding a lot of research. So if you are in network and look at those things, look at NIST uh, as one possibility. If you are doing any autonomous system AI thing that you have a lot of data that you may want to manage locally, collaborate. I would suggest that you collaborate with your uh, system-minded uh, faculty. I was telling, you know, for people who do sensor networking, the sensor networking people are the ones who have now, I'd say, the papers on the journals on, on edge computing, the ones who are more solid because they come, they've been working on this idea of uh, um, local systems for a long time. Um, I totally failed in my two years at Qualcomm to make those things pay, right? To say I need the 10 PhDs working for three years on this idea because that costs around $14 million when you count everything and you know you need to recover. It's a, it is a research organization but you still have to recover. Uh, I tell my friends you have to recover like a fourth or half they left. This is easy. Usually people ask for profit. But the research was not asking for profit but it is still hard. Why it's hard? Uh, you know, the last anecdote, I know that the talk should be uh, ending now, although I never ask how long we have. So. <laughs> I assume, you know, I assume I was going to do it 15 minutes, it didn't work. So, but I was, every time I go to the corporation, uh, you know, take the 5 a.m. flight from San Jose to San Diego, I'll get there, someone would stop me, oh, you're the cloud lady? I said, yeah, no, I'm the cloud lady. Uh, and they said, I have an idea. And they're like, I, I already knew what the idea was. It was always the same idea. Why don't we cache the 200 most popular movies from Netflix on the router that we have at all Starbucks so that people can watch the movies, you know, uh, there locally? So you think, who would like that? AT&T, Verizon, right? Because any of those are the broadbands because they're concerned too much low. And Qualcomm or any network company doing chips for cellular network, they really like to make those companies happy. So it's not surprised about that. Who be unhappy? Why Starbucks wanted me watching a two hour movie if I could buy a coffee, read two things on the internet and leave? So for them, not very good. What happens if Netflix is not working? Is the barista now going to, going to uh, reboot to the router? <laughs> right, so, so you go on all those. 
So, you know, I, would, I, I got to the point that I even implemented, I mean, you just, this is no, uh, caching is stuff, networking, this for systems people is like a, 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 a project works. And we actually put it on the router or with the product vision and everything. The challenge is really the business model. Actually, who says that uh, we can cache? You cannot cache YouTube content. If the student here is doing, you are putting the university in a bad situation. It's against the terms of services of YouTube to cache content. Right? So there is this idea about where the money is. And that's what Satya, when he gives his, his talks, it is just, it's really too early, but we, you know, one can believe the big applications and the big things can be. Could be from entertainment, could be for health. Uh, but, uh, you know, but I did talk, I were, uh, um, you may not know this, but Qualcomm did the first Kindle for Amazon entirely, including the software, the delivery of books and everything. So there's a very good relationship between Qualcomm and Amazon. And I worked on their Fire TV and we explored those ideas for Fire TV. Well, think about it now. Um, the other day I had uh, kids visiting my home, they watched a lot of uh, movies from uh, Isling or whatever it is, Netflix, and then my provider charged more for my broadband because I pay, I, know, I did more than, I don't know, 10 giga, whatever it is. But what, what happens is the idea of caching would be that, well, since uh, he, watches, uh, he watches House of Cards, usually five of them in a row, we could cache three in the morning where it costs less. Now, layer five, you know, it costs less to bring that money. Uh, you cost less to the company. But do you really want them caching things if that you don't watch it and now you, the, the provider may charge you? The same thing for cell phone. You really want them to use your broadband or your energy to speculate on you? So all of those have this business problem. I work with Akamai. Akamai owns the or has full rights for NFL content and Sony Entertainment content. So that removes all the caching. Can they cache? Yes, of course they can cache. That's their business. Right? So that eliminates that problem, but then created many others. So we worked on it with, you know, the, the um, and the last anecdote, if you have a minute, is that the CEO from Qualcomm, Matt, flew, no, the CEO from Facebook, Mark, Mark flew to uh, talk to the CEO of Qualcomm, and they had this idea of a Facebook in a village that has very cool network connect. So you're bringing the cloud now to that network in Africa or something, right? And uh, so they agreed, so that meant there came a call for me to make it happen, with a call for someone from Facebook to make it happen. As we look at the things, most people on their, on their network, 70% of people live more than 100 miles out of that. So the people who use Facebook in, the, in Africa, they usually connect with the people that have uh, out in other countries. That's actually why they connect more. So it wouldn't really work. Uh, and and uh, um, uh, anyway, so and of, you know, engineering in Facebook is very resistant. I don't blame them. They uh, they have the mandate that if it does not impact 10 million users, they shouldn't be doing. So, but but okay. But I said, well, but your CEOs, <laughs> you should do. Uh, but anyway, so we'll see what happens with this edge. It's a good time to to work on it. But you have to become a little frustrated because the workloads are not there. If you have a good idea, how you assess it. Does anyone, uh, if, you know, if you could get data sets from uh, the people doing autonomous vehicles, that would be great. So if you had data sets from the, all the water management system for, you know, for, for Florida, maybe that would be interesting. Very hard to get these data sets right now. So now that I really talked well beyond my time, and I'm uh, very sorry it took so long, uh, I just uh, conclude uh, saying that uh, this picture is really not clear yet. Not the cloud and not the edge, but that's a good thing for us. We are in computing. If we're in business, I'll be a little more worried. <laughs> okay, thank you. Did I leave any time for questions, Lindsay? Um, I think we have very short time. Yes. Maybe one question. One question here. Yes. So um, when we go many years ago, we wanted um, to have a centralized system. Then we all came to distributed system, bring it home. Now we pushed it back into the cloud and we are coming back home through the exactly. edge. Next we are going to be right back at our doorstep and we'll be going doing the same, same cycle yes. all over. So for the, the ones that have white hair or that uh, dye their hair like me, what happens is that we saw that come, that exactly there was this uh, central bureaus of informatics in the 70s that they went on, they went to the cloud, they were going out, at some point they will go into consolidate again. 
and that really will, will be people need change and their work clothes change. So it is true. So probably you should think about the edge and what will happen when the edge needs to go to the cloud. Everyone is trying to bring those resources. What if I need to get them back on the fly there? I don't know anyone working on that. And that's, uh, that's you're totally right. Uh, we have seen this. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I do I have a meeting now? Yeah. Oh, okay. There was all saying that I'll be available for questions. I'm not. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, that's all about this. Uh, I'm going to